Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, depending upon what part of the world you're in. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And um, today we have Natasha Pulley here, and she's going to be talking about her brand new book, The Kingdoms. Q holding up book. <laughs> I was there. I was just a little bit behind you. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful cover, by the way. Thank you. Uh, I'm really fond of it. When I yeah. when I put that a picture of it on Instagram, we got various comments about how gorgeous the cover was and how much people like the spiral staircase, which I assume is in the lighthouse, which we can talk about. Right. Anyway, That's Patrick, right. carry on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are also getting some signed British editions of the kingdoms, and they're on the way pretty soon, right, Barbara? I think so. Yeah. And for those of you watching, I st we still have a very small stash of this beautiful book, um, The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow, which has signed by Natasha and also has this cool little card laid in. So uh, I think we have like maybe four of them left. So I'll put the link for this and for the copies, unsigned copies of the American edition and the signed copies of the UK, I'll put them in the comments field. So if, you're, if you have questions for Natasha, go ahead and put them also put them in the comments field and I'll emerge from the shadows uh, about halfway through the program or whatever, whenever is the right moment. And I'll be happy to ask some of your questions. So Barbara, it's over to you. Thank you. You know, you don't have to go away. You can just hang out or you can disappear. You, I love his whole act. I said last night we were talking to an author who'd written about China that he should have had incense and we could have disappeared Patrick and then he could have burned the incense. <laughs> I need to work Patrick, on the... Yeah, we can work on the decor in here. Get some like velvet drapes or something. It would really be fun. Um, That's very true. But it looks better with with just two of you on the screen. So I'll 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 disappear for a little while, but I'll come back. Okay, that sounds right. great, Natasha. It's lovely to see you. You're joining us from Bath, am I right? Bath, England. Is that where you're living now? Um, actually, I just moved to Bristol, um, which is very close by, but I think infinitely cooler. So I'm very smug about that. I see. Well, I've been to both. I think that Bath always has suffered from a sort of air pollution problem because it's in that in the valley of the Avon in you know either fog or whatever. Whereas Bristol's right on the coast, right? So you've got sea breezes and yeah, absolutely. It's a very interesting city. Also, if I recall, trying to leave it was possibly some of the worst traffic I have ever been in. Have they improved? Never it? tried to leave Bristol. You can get in, but you can never go. So if you visit anybody, you'll just have to live here after you've visited. You will never leave. That's very true. There is a mystery conference um, that takes place in Bristol annually in May. And um, that was the occasion upon which I found myself unable to leave Bristol. <laughs> So maybe a sea voyage. Maybe that's the best way. Come down the coast in a boat or something similar. It's much more easily accessible by sea. <laughs> it really is. Although I was disappointed that the Harvey Bristol Cream Sherry Museum closed some years ago. That was going to be a high point of one of my visits to Bristol. Because unsurprisingly, Bristol, we'll get to her book in a minute, but Bristol is a major port and it was a major port for sherry coming up from Spain and from Madeira coming up. So there was a lot of alcohol that went through Bristol over the years. But you can do the most wonderful alcohol tour of Bristol, even so, even without the Sherry Museum, there are entire pubs dedicated only to cider because that is what we do in the West Country. <laughs> oh, well, wonderful. Are you a writer who actually takes her laptop and hangs out in the pub with the cider or do you write at home? Uh, both of those things. Um, it, it is sepulchrally quiet at home. Um, so the lockdowns here have been really hard. Um, yeah. And I've kind of, in the last few days, um, so our lockdown just lifted um, a few days ago. In the last few days, I've been bouncing into cafes and bars with the giddiest, stupidest expression on my face, but I've been full of joy. Well, I only mention it because your writing tends towards fantasy. A fantastical and so certainly writing in a place where they were very heavy on sherry and cider would not be a bad thing to be doing. Oh I see so that was a very diplomatic way of asking if I was drunk when I wrote it. Oh <laughs> yes yes broadly. 
Now, now, actually, just an infusion of alcohol might considerably, you know, have affected it. Well, let me introduce Natasha for those of you who have never met her or don't know her work. She attended Oxford University, graduated assumingly, and took an MA in creative writing from the University of East Anglia, which has a very active literary program. Lee Child, for example, his archives are at the University of East Anglia, so clearly a literary center. She's also studied in Tokyo, which relates to her last book, The Lost Future of Pepper Hero. And she was a writer in residence at the Gladstone Library. Now, I have, to, I have to ask you to talk to us about that because believe it or not, there is actually a mystery series published by Minotaur, a, a, a part of your Macmillan publishing family. And particularly one of them takes place in the Gladstone Library the body in the library sort of a thing. So tell us about really? it. So Gladstone's library is that most extraordinary thing, a hotel on the side of a 19th century library. So not only is the library itself extraordinary in that it is comprehensive, but small enough to have stacks that you can actually explore by yourself without the aid of a librarian. You can just go down there pick up a random box, go through it and find treasure, honestly. So it's that kind of library. On the side of it is a very beautiful hotel. And it's, um, in some ways it's basic because they don't have TVs in the rooms and they do have internet, but they, they, they don't love it that you use the internet. It is supposed to be a place of work and contemplation and scholarly discussion over dinner. And they have the, their own dining room which is laid out in such a way that you have to talk to people who you don't know. Um, and it works incredibly well. They, they've laid it out like um, a college at Oxford or Cambridge. And that's the kind of atmosphere that they're generating. And it's way in the wilds of North Wales. Um, and for, for, for people watching this in the US, um, you can be completely forgiven for not knowing where Wales is. It's the country that is in the West of England. Um, the west of England um, and it is very very beautiful there and quite cold and the best thing that you can possibly have in Wales is a beautiful armchair to read in by a roaring fire and that is exactly what they have at Gladstone's library. I am so envious. I did a summer at Worcester College in Oxford when I was an undergraduate at Stanford girls didn't get to be Rhodes Scholars so I was always cross about that. I don't know that I would have qualified, but I had a shot. Um, but anyway, I could hardly wait to have an Oxford experience. And, um, and it was a real, Worcester is a beautiful college, as you know, with its own grounds. It even has its own lake on the grounds, which is wonderful. But my tutor's quarters were the 12th century abbot's quarters. And, um, you know, it was, it was one of those amazing experiences to um, convene for a class in and be there. So the Gladstone Library is something I always wish that I could repeat in a way that experience. Yeah. It's, um, it's got all the benefits of Oxford without being horrendously snobbish. Yes, which I think is a really good thing. Now, why is it called Gladstone's? Is it about the prime minister or is it, it some is. wealthy family named Gladstone? No, it is the prime minister um, and it is his own, or the core of the collection is his own personal library. Uh, and when you pick up the books, I would say maybe one in 10 has uh, annotations in pencil by him. William Gladstone. So in a way, it's kind of like Jefferson's uh, li the core library before it was burned by you British. Um, core oh, library at the Library of, uh, sorry, I just couldn't resist, um, at the Library of Congress, which is since being uh, duplicated. But I think it's wonderful that William Gladstone has donated a library of his own and it's comforting to know that there were once statesmen who actually read books not it's very comforting and uh, gladstone read an awful like, he read an inhuman amount like if you just take the books off the shelves that have all his annotations on it's thousands yeah well again as i say you know i like to think they they well that's a story for another day maybe someday you will you may have you already talked about gladstone and disraeli and their amazing rivalry oh no no no, no no now, because I've always thought it was completely fascinating how different they were under Victoria and how she navigated between both of them. But 
for another day. Anyway, Natasha has also that I worked as a bookseller at Waterstones and as a publishing assistant. So she's really well grounded for being a successful author. Her first novel, The Watchmaker of Filigree Street, won a Betty Trask Award in 2016. And since she's written The Bedlam Stacks when she came to visit us at the Poison Pen and much of it takes place in Peru in a chase after uh, the bark that um, is helpful in treating malaria, quinine, right? Um, and then she wrote The Lost for Future of Pepper Harrow and now The Kingdoms. So before we talk about that, explain to a US audience what a Betty Trask Award is and why it means something. It means absolutely nothing. It's um, it's um, it's a monetary award um, that is given by um, an organisation in the UK called the Society of Authors. Um, the UK is is full of kind of small organisations that that give uh, not very well known prizes, but it really matters to writers here because the average income of a UK writer is like six thousand pounds. It's it's not enough to live on. So if you win one of these prizes, it helps you move out of your mum's attic. Wow. Okay. So it's um, a financial stipend more than it is a salute to literary excellence because the word award is pretty... <laughs> one hopes. One hopes. It's a salute to a certain amount of literary pedigree. I love it. Um, but, but, but yeah, so they, it, but that, that's how it made a difference to me. Yeah. No, I understand. I, I was just teasing you because I've already <laughs> accused you of being drunk. I already, expect so. to be roasted when I see you. I fully expect it. <laughs> I can see it. Well, you can get back at me. In any <laughs> case, um, her I find that Natasha's imagination is remarkable and she likes to exercise it in different locations. Um, so what is it? I mean, you know, it, at heart, are you an historical novelist or at heart, are you a fantasy fabulous novelist or do they just merge together in your mind and we don't need to pick them apart? Oh, for me, they merge together. Um, the historical record is only what we understand of the historical record. It's, um, it, it's a manufactured thing. The idea that history is an unchangeable and inver invariable monolith is of course false. And people living in different times had different ideas about what was realistic. And I think sometimes the only way to properly communicate those ideas and the way that people in different times thought of the world and perceived themselves in it is to go down a route that today we would recognize more as fantasy. I think that's a wonderful explanation. I often wonder what people are going to write about the last few years in America, because truly, 20 or 30 or even 50 years from now, people may think of it as all fantasy, particularly the Arizona election audit, which, you know, audit is, is way beyond the realms of fantasy. No writer could actually make up the nonsense that's currently going on. So why shouldn't you, um, if you're interpreting history? So you decided in the kingdoms that you, you postulate the idea, really scary one, that England lost the war to France, that Nelson didn't triumph at Trafalgar, and England is now a um, province, colony, whatever you want to call it, of France under Emperor Napoleon IV. That's an yes. inspired idea. What, what got you into that? Oh, thanks, mate. Um, so I'd always really liked alternative histories, but the ones that I had read focused almost exclusively on World War II what would happen if Hitler had won. Right. To some extent, this is self-explanatory. Obviously, it would be terrible. Obviously, we'd be all having a horrendous time. Um, and it, and it's, it's, it's been done many, many times by really excellent writers, people like Robert Harris with Fatherland, people like CJ Sansom with uh, Dominion, stuff like SSGB. It, it all is of astonishing pedigree. Um, and I wanted to do one for years, but what put me off was, well, it, it's been done. And the problem with writing an alternate history is that you have to rely on the reader to know what the real history is. And my, my fear was, well, if you go back further than World War II, can you rely on just ordinary people who read, knowing the outcome of any particular battle that is now not necessarily hugely in the international consciousness? And then I read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clarke. 
And at the time, I did not know anything about the Napoleonic Wars. I mean, and this is this is me. I live in a country where the capital city has a thing called Trafalgar Square and Lord Nelson stands on top of a column in Trafalgar Square. I still had no idea why that was or who that was. Um, you can tell that my education was very insular. I know about James Joyce. I do not know about Lord Nelson. Um, but when I read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, what I realized was that the paucity of my knowledge did not take away from how much I enjoyed the book. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, I, I can do this. I'm going to do the Napoleonic Wars and I'm going to do the Napoleonic Wars going wrong. Well, I think, I think even people not super well educated probably know what Trafalgar was or, or certainly probably know who Napoleon was. So it wouldn't More be like seriously overestimating me as a reader. And I think many people as a reader. I don't mean to keep insulting you. It sort of sounds like that, but that's not what I'm doing. But um, <laughs> I, it's, it's just, you know, they are so like, and, and you know, if you're a reader, um, you probably have at some point brushed across Bernard Cornwell, for example. I just learned today that he's actually writing a new Sharp novel called Sharp's Assassin. And, you know, that, that whole series takes place um, about uh, an officer serving in Portugal under the, the flank attack, um, trying to contain... I think, so I think this curious thing happens um, if you are not educated in history. This is personal experience, I'm not like talking down to anyone. Um, you can read lots and lots of novels about a period in history. Um, and you can read novels like the Sharp novels that are set in the Napoleonic Wars. And you can read stuff like Patrick O'Brien's series that, at sea and, and all of these things. But you don't necessarily link these up into this huge world event that is what we now call the Napoleonic Wars. You can do this without, without having any overview of what is going on or any understanding of what the significance of this is. So for example, I had heard of the Battle of Trafalgar. I had heard of Lord Nelson. Of course I had. I have even been on the victory. But what I did not know was that the Battle of Trafalgar was important because if we had lost, the French would have invaded Kent. Got it. You know, I'm handicapped in this whole discussion because I'm a lifelong historian. So it's really hard for me to sort yeah, that's of- that's a severe you know, disability. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I definitely, I definitely see your point in terms of, um, yeah, overall, the overall consequences of it um, perhaps are indeed not, not familiar to people. And, you know, I'm also of a generation that learned everything, because I'm a lot older than you, learned everything reading and studying um, stuff in school that was tied to all of these seminal events. I mean, we actually had to read the US Constitution and the Federalist Papers and, and all kinds of things that everybody seems to skip now, where, you know, they well, just zip onto yeah. Wikipedia or something. The other thing that I should point out here is that um, US citizens have a far better general education than English people do. And I'll give you an example of this. So we do um, these things called GCSEs when we're 16. And that is the last time we study a range of subjects. So when I was 16, that was the last time I studied maths. That was the last time I studied science. After you were 16, you specialized down into three related subjects. And I did English literature, Latin and art, which is why I have zero engineering knowledge, science knowledge, mathematical knowledge, nothing. And so what tends to happen, so because we specialize so young, and likewise, there is really no such thing at British universities as a major and a minor. You don't have an education that covers many things. You can't really be doing a degree in physics and then do psychology 101. This is not the way that our university system works. These departments don't talk to each other. So our education is incredibly specific. And so what I have found in general is that if you talk to a British person, they will know a lot about one very specific thing and nothing about anything else. Whereas if you talk to American students, they know an awful lot about an awful lot of things, but often not quite in the depth that that British person would have known their one thing. So there is a difference in our education system quite generally, I think. Wow, I am so glad you pointed that out. I have not given that consideration at all. Um, 
Good point. Anyway, you have decided, um, now that we've explored that, you decided that you would, in fact, do your version of the fatherland or something, but you would take it back to Trafalgar and the Napoleonic War rather than writing about um, Hitler and the Nazis in World War II, where Britain, I might add, was in the same vulnerable position. That at least is true, that in either case, events could have gone so that Britain was invaded and nothing would be the same. Absolutely. And, and I think I think one of the things that it's very easy for um, particularly US readers to kind of to kind of blank is how close Britain is to mainland Europe. We are 26 miles off the coast of France. That is how close we were to Napoleon and that's how close we were to Hitler. So all this kind of eulogizing stuff we do about the D-Day landings, it's because it was that close to our shore. Very true. And you're, you've been fortunate or sometimes not so fortunate in the fact that it's a really terrible body of water, the English Channel with really awful weather. And many bad things have happened all the way back to right after um, right after the you know, 1066 when the heir to the throne went down on the white ship, um, I think right, right around 1100. Absolutely. And even the invasion, the Norman invasion, William the Conqueror coming across in 1066 was delayed and delayed and delayed because the weather on the channel was so bad they couldn't sail. Absolutely true. I mean, I've been back and forth under it on the channel and over it on the ferry and flying over it. Um, and it is for a small body of water. Um, a, it's had an enormous um, historical, political, et cetera, significance. Um, and I think, in fact, that England was at one point part of Europe's landmass and something or other happened to open up the channel in the same way that the Black Sea was um, probably created by some upheaval that opened up the Adriatic to up through the Dardanelles and, and the whole bit. That's another interesting part of, the world, part of the world where a small body of water has a remarkably long range and far ranging effect. In any case, where are we? Um, we are how many years away from um, the French triumph at Trafalgar and Britain going down to defeat? Um, how do you mean, sorry? Oh, I mean in your book. I'm sorry. In the Kingdoms, where is the book initially anyway? Where does it take off? So we start um, in 1898 and move on to 1901. So we're almost 100 years after. So Tra Trafalgar, the battle was fought in 1805. Right. And so, you know, is, is your book, tell us about the structure of the book, because it's an interesting structure. Yes. So it begins in 1898. Um, and Britain at this point is a well-established colony of France. And it's become the industrial center of the French Republic. And so London is now known as the Black City because it is full of industry, it's full of factories pumping out this endless amount of smoke for the production of steel that is shipped off around the French Empire. That seems to me to be realistic because one of the resources that Britain has always had in massive abundance is coal and iron. We make steel here, we always have. Um, and so, that felt like the kind of thing that would that would take hold, um, because slavery had been outlawed on the main on, on in in the sovereign country of most empires, but not in the colonies. Um, there is now slavery alive and well in England, and in fact, the narrator of the book um, is a slave at the start. Um, and all sorts of other things have changed as well. So there is a terrorist group called the Saints who wants to reinstate the English King. Everyone thinks they're crazy. Um, Scotland is completely separate from England because it is run by royalists, whereas England in the South is part of the French Republic. There is an ongoing war um, that is waging a kind of devastating Syria-like conflict all through Scotland um, and particularly in Edinburgh. So lots and lots and lots of things are different. And this is where we begin. Why, um, how do you postulate that Scotland, which is after all a contiguous landmass to Britain, managed to keep itself um, not as a French colony, but rather a haven for royalists. And if I recall right in the book, also Glasgow is a, is a terrorist center. Yeah, so 
the reason that I decided to do that is that, as you say, even though Scotland is indeed a continuous landmass with England, and this is the structure of Great Britain, Scotland in the north, England in the south, um, Scotland has historically been extremely separate from England, and that border has been fiercely defended. So even though England was part of the, or what became England, was part of the Roman Empire, Scotland, no. That's why Hadrian's Wall is there. Right? The Romans never managed to get into Scotland. The reason for this is that the landscape, although it is continuous, changes dramatically once you get into Scotland. This, um, until actually quite recently, was a place of mountains and inaccessible glens, and it was very, very hard to put roads through it. Um, a lot of the population centers are far apart and isolated. It is a very difficult place to conquer. So what I thought was, even though technically there had been a union of the crowns for a long time, Scotland is the kind of place that could possibly stay uh, independent with a great force of will, and that's what they've done. Well, I think it's certainly possible. You're not even accounting the role of the perfectly terrible weather. Um, on, Indeed uh, not. I mean, it's, it's horrendous. And I think that's why the Romans didn't bother. They just went, oh, more rain. Good. And left. <laughs> Yeah, um, I've actually been along Hadrian's Wall hike part of it, and you know they did make a serious effort to have one of their, um, um, you know, Roman bath or whatever. But I thought surely, you know, the poor people stationed up there on that wall might have spent all their time in the, you know, the hot tubs and so forth because it was so brutal. In fact, Bath, your lovely city where you did live, um, was is, you know, partly the reason the Romans congregated there was for the hot springs. It was warm. <laughs> it was warm yeah. in a really rainy country. And cold, yeah. And also very good for rheumatism, which I think must have been a true curse, you know, for people who lived and Anyway, we, we digress, but I've, off, I've always thought that Scotland was defended in large part, not just by its landscape, which you rightly describe, but by its, by its weather. And, and it always, interestingly enough though, historically, it's been allied to France for, because Scotland stayed Catholic for a long time. Mary Queen yeah. of Scots was originally married to the Dauphin of France and trying to remember, I think she might briefly have become king, but, I mean queen because he died just so suddenly. So, um, you know, while England was going Protestant and Tudor and all the rest of it, Scotland was um, still very much tied to France. So I think it's interesting in your book that it is, in fact, you know, not tied to France, but the, the not France part. So yeah. did you do that on purpose or did or just sort of- Absolutely. Um, so the period of history that you're talking about, of course, is um, Tudor history where Catholicism is still huge in Scotland. And um, the lady we were just talking about is uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, um, who was married to the Dauphin of France and then um, became queen in Scotland in her own right. Uh, didn't rule for very long before Elizabeth beheaded her. Um, so that's, that's the 16th century. As time moves on, though, Scotland becomes ferociously Protestant, yep. puritanical, Calvinist, cold hearted religion, I would say. Um, and they become more and more aligned with states like Denmark. So Mary, Queen of Scots' son, James I, married Anne of Denmark in 1589. Um, and after that, what we have is a, a religious union between those very northern countries in Europe. We have close relationships between Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Scotland, to the extent that Norway owned um, the Orkneys in, in Scotland until relatively recently. So that is the kind of the socio-economic bloc that Scotland belongs to after the time that we were just talking about when they were largely Catholic. And it seems to me that... Um, Napoleon had problems with cold countries anyway. Um, he had problems in Russia. <laughs> Understood. Remember, I mean, there was one, right? <laughs> he had problems in Russia. He had problems in Scandinavia. And it seemed to me that if Scotland was allied, as it basically was in this period, with Scandinavian countries, it would possibly stand a chance of remaining independent from the French. I think that's true. And of course, if you're trying to write, I mean, if part of your thought, was to write something not World War II, but but similar, except earlier than Hitler too had problems with cold countries. Um, just contradicting, <laughs> I'm my, proud. Yes. contradicting my statement that you know people who rule us might actually read because he apparently at least missed out on that part. Oh, it turns out 
still a bad idea. (laughs) I mean, it really is interesting, the parallels between uh, Napoleon and Hitler. Uh, from England's perspective, anyway, if you if you think about it, and oh, not that it's not that far removed in time, you know, um, not even a century and a half. But anyway, I can see how this was irresistible. So we're in 1898, 1901. You set the scene, but then a very strange thing happens to your narrator. He gets he gets a letter that really oversets it. It does indeed. So right at the start of the book, um, the narrator, whose name is Joe, um, he has lost his memory. He doesn't understand what's going on or who he is. But very soon he's claimed by um, his family, uh, his wife, Um, but he doesn't recognize her and he lives with her for a while. But before very long, in the post, there comes the most extraordinary postcard. And on the front is a picture of a lighthouse. And on the back, there is a very simple message that says, dearest Joe, come home if you remember M. He doesn't know who M is, but he thinks it might be this woman called Madeline, who he remembers in snatches. And he can't remember if she's his wife or his sister, but he knows that she's important to him somehow. And he also recognizes this weird lighthouse. But the other thing about this letter is that the postmark is from almost a hundred years before. And he asks the postman and he says, well, what the hell is this? And the postman says, no, no, it's real. It's not a joke. They held it at the sorting office for a hundred years and here it is, enjoy. And Joe has no idea what's going on, but he knows that the lighthouse is important. He knows that something really strange is going on. And so what he does um, is he finds the company that built the lighthouse and the lighthouse engines and he goes to see them. And they're in London. It's uh, run by a French guy called Demeriton. And, um, he, Demeriton says, well, you know, this lighthouse is not a hundred years old. We built it two years ago. Funny that. And so Joe has reached a dead end, but what he does is he starts working for the engine company who makes lighthouse engines. And when the engine at this lighthouse breaks two years later, he volunteers to go and fix it because this is his one and only chance to find out what the hell is going on. Wow, well, we're not going to tell anybody watching it what happens, but I think it's a fascinating premise to get a postcard 100 years old with a picture on it of a lighthouse that didn't exist until two years ago, and then have an opportunity to go visit it. Tell us the name of the lighthouse and where it is. Sure. So the lighthouse's name is Island Moor, which means the Great Island in Scottish Gaelic. Um, And the island and the lighthouse itself is about 10 miles offshore of the Outer Hebrides. The Outer Hebrides are a series of islands well off the Scottish coast. They are extremely cold, extremely windy. There are no trees there because it is so windy and so cold. Um, So it is 10 miles away from the very, very edge of UK territory. Uh Aha. Well... What can we say? Um, not anymore about the actual plot. You must have had a wonderful time writing this. The most spectacular time. Um, I went up to Edinburgh and I sat in a cafe opposite Edinburgh Castle and wrote chunks of this novel, like all in one go. So well before 2020, obviously. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. because your last book published in 2020, but there's usually, what, about a two-year gap between when you write a book and when it actually appears in published form for the reader. Absolutely. And I took a long time to write this new book, The Kingdoms, um, because it was, as you can imagine, because it's all tiny, wimey and structurally all over the place. It was a mess for many drafts. So I started writing it in about 2016. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, plenty of opportunity before the pandemic to research. When, When you're writing a book like this, do you, is it, do you write it linearly, which seems kind of difficult, or do you envision it sort of in chunks or in scenes, and then eventually you have to bridge them all together in some form? It is, of course, the second one. Um, I defy anyone to write linearly. I think I know one writer who claims to do it, and I feel that she is lying. Um, it is very, very hard to write linearly. Um, particularly if you've got a book that's kind of all over the place. And where this book started is actually about a quarter of the way through what is now the published book. And it's the scene where Joe gets to the lighthouse and starts looking around inside. Um, And it's intriguing because the three lighthouse keepers who are supposed to be there have vanished. And this is a real story. Three lighthouse keepers did vanish on Island Moor in 1901. 
Um, so this is based on a real thing and that's the germ of the book. There's actually a book out, might be called The Lighthouse Keepers. I, I read it not too long ago, based on that story. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, you... it's very much in the cultural consciousness. I think the book is called The Lamplighters. Um, yes, I think you're right. Yeah. And I mean, there's a Gerard Butler film about this as well. <laughs> like, it's pretty, it's, 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 I think, particularly in the UK, I think it's relatively well known because it is yet an unsolved mystery. I mean, these guys just vanished one night and it was, there was a storm, so maybe they drowned, but all their oil skins, their heavy weather gear was all still inside. So no one really knows why. It's like the Mary Celeste. No one will ever really understand why that ship was abandoned yeah. with no, um, there are, there are fascinatingly enough, you know, historical mysteries that um, very likely will never be solved. Even with advanced technology, there's still, I mean, the only possible thing that could have happened to the lighthouse guys is that they sank so deeply into the ocean that nobody has yet, you know, but then you have to ask yourself why, you know. Well, if why were they outside in the down, I mean, I, I think we can be pretty sure that they died, but what yeah. possible circumstance led them to do that? Well, yeah, and, and if you embrace the idea that they drowned and sank, you know, then, then you have to ask yourself, how could they have sunk so far that, um, you know, if they weren't like encased in concrete or something, why, why would they have been, why would they have disappeared forever, so to speak, exactly. to the bottom of and the ocean? And why were they outside without their gear? That's exactly. crazy. This is no, it is, and, you know, but it's wonderful for novelists. <laughs> it's, it's great because you can take these. You know, I was talking a couple of weeks ago to Lee Child and Laurie King, who together are, uh, put together the Mystery Writers of America's most recent handbook for mystery writers. And one of the things that Lee said, which I totally agree with, is that you could take the same incident, the same version of, of I mean, the same event, and you could give it to 20 writers and you would get 20 completely different stories. So it's you know, it doesn't really matter what the kernel, uh, kernel is, that writers each embrace, embrace it differently. They bring their own voice, they bring their own imagination, they bring, so you, know, you could have a hundred people write about the three disappearing lighthouse keepers and come up with a hundred different possible Absolutely. explanations. I mean, this is the same throughout historical fiction, isn't it? I mean, like dozens and dozens of writers write about Henry VIII and his six wives, and we, we but we never get tired of it because it's always going to be interesting. Dozens and dozens of people write about Jefferson, about Lincoln, about all these historical figures, but that doesn't matter. It's all enriching. Oh, look at Hilary Mantle. I mean, who would have guessed, you know, that Thomas Cromwell could be, you know, or a raging hit um, in the, I mean, seriously, you know, I was like, really, Wolf Hall? Um, yeah. Because, you know, I, to me, that's like so old school. I read about Thomas Cromwell ages ago, but but the, that Thomas Cromwell is not her Thomas Cromwell. You Absolutely. know, she's, she's created her own. <laughs> It's not like she came from nowhere and did that. She wrote a lot of novels before that. And you can see her through her career. It's fascinating, like really gradually leading up to that. You know, she start with kind of speculative fiction with Flood and Beyond Black. And then you get this extraordinary book, you know, A Place of Greater Safety about the French Revolution, which is all I know about the French Revolution, by the way, reading that ridiculously long book. And then finally, we, so she gets into history that her readership, which is English, knows. As soon as you get onto Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, everyone's like, fantastic. Well, yes, it is, it is true. I once asked, um, there was a, you know, a huge rage for historical fiction. I opened The Poison Pen in 19... 89, and it wasn't, it was all around the era where Ellis Peters wrote her first brother Cadwell, A Morbid Taste for Bones. It wasn't that far from Uberto Eco's, you know, remarkable book, which I'm blanking on. Um, oh, The Name of the Rose. Thank you. The name of the, it's my senior thing. I can't remember no the anymore. The name of the room. A lot of people, and, you know, on purpose forget Umberto Echo titles. So that's fine. No, 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 no. That was a genuine whatever. But interestingly enough, because as I've already mentioned to you, I've always been, um, I, I am an historian by training and historical fiction fan. There'd been this kind of desert of historical fiction for at least a decade before all that happened. Um, and as a consequence of the fact that nobody was publishing historical fiction in the 70s and 80s to any degree, many of those people turned to writing mystery. And then there was this push from the success of The Name of the Rose and a Morbid Taste for Bones. And so all throughout the 90s um, and into the early 21st century, there was this raft of historical novels 
I mean, so many. And then, and then it's kind of died away again as, as these things kind of do. And much of it moved over into real outright fantasy, epic fantasy and so forth, where people, you know, staged all kinds of medieval dramas and other stuff, um, sent people on quests, because that's really kind of the point of epic fantasy to a great degree. Kingdoms rise and fall, people go on quests, the whole nine yards. And now, you know, now we're seeing a resurgence. But interestingly, as you've already pointed out, it's World War II has become like a complete subgenre of historical fiction and and not just World War II, but women's stories, as opposed to, you know, the guns of Navarone or something. Yeah, we're, and we're seeing retellings of ancient history, I think, is becoming very, very popular, particularly in the UK, it is. You know, it is so, there too. Yeah. yeah, Ariadne is new out, Madeline, you know, Madeline Miller, Circe, and so forth. Uh, yeah. then, which is just our um, sister song is huge here, yeah. Right. And I like that because this means that people who don't know history are now, you know, learning history, even if it's not like fact presented history, but rather stories, which I, or narrative nonfiction, which I think oftentimes people learn more from that because the story, you know, helps them, um, takes them to places they wouldn't necessarily go on their own because it might be boring or the facts don't stick, but the power of the story makes the events resonate Absolutely. in their heads and i could not be behind it more because honestly like how many people go out of their way to read the iliad but loads of people have read song of achilles brilliant no it's really true i always wanted to read the Iliad. i envy my husband who was able to study classical greek in college stanford strangely enough did not offer either latin oh, or Greek. no i'm serious neither one and i was a um a french student in high school and french and spanish were my thing somehow i never learned latin so i have been learning latin through duolingo which is this wonderful you know app and and realizing how much i missed but it's not too late um latin is just the most fantastic language to know it just it's so useful if you're interested in english because it informs everything well, it really does, but I'm, I've decided that I'm just not up to learning classical Greek. So my long held desire to read the Iliad and the Odyssey, the original classical Greek, I am not going to attain it. I'm just not, I've had to well, resign myself to that. Well, as I'm sure you know, um, the, the Fagel English translation is utterly beautiful. True, but it's still, I still wanted to read it. In still the want to read it in ancient Greek, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I'm really pleased to see historical fiction, whether it's you know narrative nonfiction or straight historical drama or fantastical historical fiction, making such a remarkable uh, renaissance. Because I gave it the British pronunciation. Notice that renaissance. It. I was very impressed. I'm trying to stay in you know, the whole thing. But anyway, because I think I think it may help, you know, people learn things that um that they will benefit from or are just generally a good thing to know, but might otherwise be ignored. So I'm just delighted. I've loved all your books. And you know, I you know how much I liked your Peruvian book, possibly because I've been to Peru so often. Um, but um I thought a lot of people probably never really thought about the botanical expeditions that Britain set out, whether it was from Kew Garden up the Amazon to steal the rubber tree, or whether it was, you know, to come to Peru and steal the, I never can pronounce it, the, what is it? Chinchona, Chinchona bark. Chinchona bark, thank you, making it into quinine, or, you know, various other expeditions that allowed Britain to develop bioscience at a time, you know, biotechnology in its most basic form, which was to go to the plant and- Well, you know, we did what we were good at. We were really good at going out and stealing stuff. Well, you were. And in fact, the whole, you know, the whole mutiny on the bounty thing, you know, I've always thought that while Captain Bly and the person of Charles Lawton is, you know, a forever villain to movie fans, you know, he made this remarkable 2000 mile voyage in an open boat, still taking the tree with him or the trees that, you know, he had been sent out to do. And I thought that's British tenacity to a remarkable oh, yeah. degree. Uh, also, I think that's fear of court martial. <laughs> Right, very likely so. Yeah, you know, lots of lots of history history actually becomes apocryphal because you know it's like like taking a, a conversation and you know it's a, a legal thing where you take a test. 
a legal test where you take a conversation and then you pass it around to like 20 different auditors. And by the time it circles back around, it rarely resembles the story that began it, which is an argument against um, eyewitness testimony in court being notoriously unreliable. Um, but anyway, um, I love I love the way that you interpret history. Let's call Patrick up without incense. Alas, we probably should have burned some and see what what he might have to say here. What a great conversation. I've really been enjoying this. Um, I like particularly what you were saying, Natasha, about about the differences between uh, American education and British, you know, how we tend to know a broad array of largely useless, shallow knowledge, really. <laughs> um, and maybe, maybe not. But that's interesting. I don't, think, about I don't think that's quite fair, Patrick. And actually, she was telling me, I, I, um, I'm really fascinated by that insight, because a lot yeah. of what I know about British education, I've learned from Dorothy Sayers and her ilk. And, you know, I would never have accused Dorothy Sayers of being less well educated <laughs> than I am. So it does give a slightly different spin to to whom you're talking about. But I have watched and it's a, it's a really good point. We have watched a lot of British television during the pandemic, British crime shows and so forth. And whether you're watching Vera or whether you're watching Scott and Bailey, Rob and I often turn to each other and say, where did they get these people? I mean, are these actual actors? Or are these people that they have, you know, more or less found on the street and drafted into? But the level of their ignorance is so astounding that it's hard to imagine how they can even navigate the world. And you know, you don't know how much of that is for the drama and you know, an unfair characterization of who they might really be and how much they're in the story because that is who they are and they brought them in. Um, but it's really been fascinating to see it. And we have to see here, I'm sure, I didn't watch The Wire and other things like that, Patrick, but I'm sure that there are uh, many people in American dramas um, that, that you might react similarly to. Maybe I just watch more of the British ones, so I'm less well tutored in the whole thing. Would that be true? I don't yeah. really know. <laughs> no, I was asking Patrick, sorry, oh, he would know. I don't know. I, you know, the point though, you, you were talking a little bit earlier about the Iliad and the Odyssey and, you know, some of these essential texts that you know i was a am a recovering english major so i you know i got to read the fagels translations and all that good stuff um but it's interesting how uh i think a lot of people are familiar with these stories without necessarily having the name for them because they've been retold in so many ways yeah. uh, you know by other other people you know you see different interpretations of that those basic quest stories and um all over the place, you know. It's just a a common archetype of us of, of history, I suppose. Uh, and there, yeah, there's always new versions of those stories. Absolutely, too, you know, the Shakespearean stories. Well, I was just writing up Ariadne. What I can't think of the author's name, but anyway, it's a, a very very good, very new book. And Ariadne is a different spin on Mary Reynolds. The Bull from the Sea, which is one of my very favorite historical novels. And she has her own version of what happened um, after Theseus slew the Minotaur and sailed away and what happened to Ariadne. Um, and so, you know, there are all kinds of ways to interpret the Greek myths and the Arthurian tales and all the rest of it. Um, right. right. And I'm, I, I can imagine that, as you say, lots of people don't know the origins of those stories because they've read them in a different Right. context or a modern update or something those wellsprings go deeper and you know deep and deep and deep into our history you know um but some questions yes there are some uh let's see sarah asks uh, natasha could you tell us about any future works or current works in progress sure so next for me is going to be a bit of a departure from my normal uh work um, there's going to be no fantasy in it at all. It's going to be straight up historical fiction. And the reason it can be that way is the story itself is so weird. It's all set on a Russian nuclear installation in 1963. Um, there is a place and it still exists called City 40. Um, and it was one of the largest producers of weapons grade plutonium in the Soviet Union. 
1958, they had an enormous nuclear rea uh, reaction accident. Um, a reactor exploded and irradiated thousands of square miles of territory. This is long before Chernobyl. Um, they did not have the technology to clean it up, so they left it. And they turned this into what they called a radio-ecological nature reserve in order to study the effects of the radiation, the ongoing and serious radiation, uh, on the flora and fauna, including the human population. And the book follows a scientist who has been uh, really press-ganged into working in this place uh, as he finds out gradually, peels back layers of secrecy to get to what really happened and why, um, and what are the scientists looking for? Wow, you're right. You didn't, you didn't need to introduce any fantasy into that at all. No, you don't need to, not with something like radiation, it's so strange. Wow, did that, where did that particular idea come from? Did you read a, a story and say, wow, I need to investigate this further? Yeah, um, so I watched the extraordinarily good TV show, Chernobyl, and then I went away and I read the nonfiction book that it was based on. And in that nonfiction book, there was one line that referenced City 40. And I went, why have I not heard of this? And I went away and I read all the Russian scientists who had talked about City 40 and what happened there. And then I wrote this book in about four months. Wow, fantastic. So um, with any luck, it'll be out relatively soon then, probably 2023, yeah. if not 2022. I'm hoping 2022. Wonderful. So you wrote the book in, in a four month frenzy? Yep, as fast wow. as I've ever written anything. I was exhausted, obviously. I will well, we'll never do it again. <laughs> that's how I wrote it, yeah. Um, there are some people I'm sure that are, that, are, uh, that are writers who are interested in, you know, you always get questions about your, your habits and, how you go about getting the work done. Any interesting, do you write at night? Do you write in the morning? Do you have a certain word count? She writes for? drunk in cafes that make cider in West of England. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what I do. Just drunk, be drunk all the time, it works. No, no, it doesn't. Really Don't be drunk, about write the most terrible garbage. Um, so I am in a very privileged position and uh, this is what I do for a living, so I can do it whenever. Um, I, tend to work about an eight hour day, but it's you know not as serious an eight hour day as most people. I'll do this for half an hour, wander off, come back for half an hour. Yeah, it kind of gets itself done. And it's something that I really like doing. So it never presents itself as work. I always rush back to do it. If you take me away from it for more than six hours, I will get very anxious and snappish. Um, so I think mainly if you can make it the thing you want to come back to, you will get your novel done. Um, let's see, uh, Groves, I believe is the name here, uh, asks, uh, when you were growing up, what novels took your, uh, took your imagination to become the writer you are today? And uh, let's see, where would you like to take your writing in, say, 10 years? Okay, first part of the question. So I was hugely influenced um, by a fantasy writer called Robin Hobb, who I would say is the best in the business. Um, she is extraordinarily good at world building. Um, reading her books taught me everything I know about world building. Um, and I also grew up on a healthy diet of Terry Pratchett. So this is like pretty hardcore fantasy stuff all the way through, um, ranging on that spectrum between extremely serious and scholarly and very, very, very funny. Um, so that's, that's where I was reading as a child. And I would say certainly those are the largest childhood influences on me. Um, 10 years time, I just cannot say. That is a long time. 10 years ago, I was very young and I would not even have thought of the first atom of this idea. There's no way you can predict what you're gonna be interested in next. The only thing you can do is sit back and wait for it to hit you in the face. Uh, a question from Margaret, she wants to know, can you tell us a little bit just about what the, the watchmaker is about? I think a lot of people maybe aren't familiar with your work. And... Sure thing. So The Watchmaker of Filigree Street is my first novel. Um, and it is set in London in the 1880s. And this is when um, an Irish terrorist organization called Clan the Gale was beginning to bomb Westminster, which is our governmental center. The story follows a young telegraphist called Nathaniel Steepleton. A telegraphist is somebody who operates the telegraph, and this was a very common job in the 1880s in London. He works um, for the Home Office at Westminster. And one day he receives a bomb threat. 
Not very long later, a bomb does indeed go off. But before it goes off, something strange happens to him. Um, he goes home to his very, very tiny apartment in a horrible district of London called Pimlico. And he found that, finds that somebody has broken in and on his bed, they have left a watch. And on the day that the bomb goes off, the watch begins to tick, begins to count down, and it sets an alarm off that saves his life when the bomb goes off. And the book is about what happens when he decides to go and look for the watchmaker. Wow. It's a terrific book. There you Thanks. have it. And a very well-spoken summary. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I think that may be all the questions that have come in so far. Do you, have there been any TV or movie adaption adaptations yet, or is there anything in, in the works? No, um, the rights to the watchmaker of Filigree Street have been bought, um, but um, so far it's not being made. Hmm. Historical fiction is much more expensive to make than commercial fiction. And so it, it is handicapped by except for Agatha Christie, where apparently everybody kept a car from the 1920s and 30s and an appropriate house. But um, to go back into the 19th and 18th century is really extremely expensive. More and more of it's, more and more of it's getting done, though. It is. Um, and a lot of that is because of computer-enabled um, stuff, you know, computer graphics and other stuff where you don't have to have the real thing. You can simulate it. Um, Drones are helping do a lot of things that used to be horrendously expensive. There, are, There's a lot of great um, serial television and, um, and nature programs. We just watched something on uh, the magical Andes or we watched something um, trying to think what, and there's a, a new thing on PBS about a, a water hole, two water holes that were created in Africa and Tanzania and um, and then they put cameras all around it and drones and stuff to see what would happen, whether the animals would show up and how they would behave and, you know, other stuff. So I think that historical fiction will benefit from all of this because, you know, you don't have to actually replicate the Titanic or something. Now you can do it with um, with computer stuff. Yes. So I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, long, how long Ann Perry's books, for example, or Victorian books have been under contract for television for, you know, almost as long as we've known her, uh, but they're just and so expensive. Stuff is bought and never made. I mean, most most of yeah. the projects that are bought are never made. So well, I have what, happened, what happened to the second half of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell? You know, I mean, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, we really enjoyed it. And then, you know, the first part came to a close and and that's it. I, every once in a while, I go looking for it, thinking surely they're gonna show us the rest of it, but. Yeah, they just never did. Yeah, I know. Um, so it's it's hard to say, but I'm encouraged for you because I think that um, the technology now exists to um, support, you know, turning your and it's it's even harder if there's magical stuff in it than yeah, absolutely you know, than, than straight stuff. Yeah, which is not an Agatha Christie issue at all. So there we are. Right. Anyway, it's been fascinating to talk to you. I missed you uh, last year. We were so disappointed that COVID shut down your I mean, we were all booked and ready to go and then bang. And, and I know, I and it, like that. the lockdown happened here like the week before I was supposed to come see you. I know, and I was really looking forward to it because although I have not spent time in Tokyo, I have actually spent quite a lot of time in Japan. And I thought, yeah. I thought that the premise of your book, taking... It's a pregnant pause, Natasha. Oh, yeah, of course. This happens Start. sometimes on Zoom. <laughs> well, if you're able to come and see us for the next book, we can always go back and review all you know the books that we missed. So <laughs> the, the well, range of books I published in the pandemic. Right. Yeah, <laughs> we can have a whole Natasha, you know, evening. It'll be wonderful. Thank you for your time. I'm so glad that you moved to Bristol, which is a wonderful place. And um, it's been grand talking to you. Thanks to all of you who've been watching it. Yeah. If um, because of this time of day or evening. If you know people who missed it, it's this video is going to live forever on our Poison Pen Facebook video page. And there'll be a podcast tomorrow when I may have Rob cut out whatever appears to be insults that I have hurled at Natasha. Or maybe... no, 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 you have to keep them. You have to keep them because people <laughs> have we'll to just let them how much grace I took it. <laughs> Actually, we were just joshing. And if you think about it, I'm almost three times your age. 
So, you know, we do have to keep that in mind. Uh, we had a very okay. interesting discussion <laughs> last week, didn't we? Or earlier this week with two authors in their 40s. And it was just fascinating for me. It was like looking, I was like a window into, you know, a world that is unfamiliar to me. Um, and I, I did think, Patrick, I was right to say that, that the way those women viewed their books would not have been possible without the sexual revolution and social media. I mean, the world has truly changed with both of those things and allowed you to explore, explore things that, that we couldn't have even imagined when I was in my 40s. You know, it just wouldn't have, um, stories would not, not, not have been developed credibly. In that. There are so, stories developing now that we couldn't have written even 10 years ago. Very true. No, absolutely true. So we'll see how it all goes. Anyway, on that note, um, enjoy the rest of your day or evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. Night, Natasha. Good night. Thank you so much.